Hey, Vipin? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm putting. Yeah, yeah. I'm putting you on the call. I, I, I have it all recorded. It, it, the recording is going on. Uh, you know, you can, you can start. They can all hear you. Yeah. Um, sorry, guys. Uh, I lost connection to the internet, which is, of course, catastrophic. Just at this moment. Um, I will be back um, on the internet as soon as I can. But in the meantime, uh, welcome to the uh, Capital Markets SIG call. And I'm connected through Money's uh, phone. I can talk about a couple of things. One is the um, code of conduct. We are supposed to be obeying the code of conduct from uh, the next foundation, which means that we treat each other with respect. The second uh, I, I item on the list is the antitrust policy. That is the only requirement that is needed for us to be on this call. Uh, otherwise, it's completely open. So if you do not agree with the antitrust policy, please log off the call. Uh, then uh, I will first start off by asking um, Kirti, if he's on, to talk about the insurance subgroup. And then we will uh, launch directly into the, uh, into the white paper. Thank you. Um, thanks, Vipin. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kirti Gobnamudi. Um, I'm with Civitas Fintech, uh, which is um, a startup which is based out of London. Um, I've been a part of the capital markets SIG for a while now. Um, and I've been working in both the domains, which is capital markets as well as insurance markets. Um, I've seen that um, there are quite a few blockchain and distributed ledger related projects uh, which are running um, with a certain degree of maturity in Europe as well as uh, UK for the insurance space. Um, however, there's still a lot of hurdles that need to be overcome. And um, I thought it would be a great opportunity for people who have expertise in the insurance markets to come together and, and do something uh, similar to what um, Capital Markets SIG has been able to achieve so far. Um, some of the things I was proposing uh, are more on the lines of um, uh, building taxonomy, um, looking at uh, standardized data structures, a common domain model for insurance, and of course, there are lots of use cases uh, from B3I and other companies within um, the insurance space. So I think it's a, it's a great opportunity uh, for us to kind of focus on some of these things. Um, we, I've also kind of looked at um, updating parts of the um, insurance project subgroup, which is uh, within the uh, wiki for Hyperledger. So there are some of the points that I speak about uh, which are clearly articulated there. Um, I also think that there's a great opportunity to look at some of the business architecture, which is associated with um, maturity that is required for a business to be on the blockchain. So th these are some of the business problems that I'm trying to kind of address. Uh, with me, I bring in um, some more colleagues of mine who are interested in being a part of this focus group. And, and um, that's kind of the gist of the message that I wanted to kind of uh, put forth to the group and kind of hear your thoughts on um, um, what, how should we kind of progress on this and, and what, what, what could possibly be the next steps. Thoughts, anybody, questions now? Uh, is there anyone associated with insurance in this group today? I mean, anyone on the call in any form? Uh, not me, unfortunately. Me neither. So I, I guess then I think it, it opens the avenue for us to kind of bring 
um, some more people from insurance background into the specifics of group and organize uh, a different focus group all together money. So that's just a thought process I want to put forward to. If, if you have colleagues that you want to refer to, uh, to this subgroup, insurance market subgroup, you're more than welcome to send out um, you know, the links which are on the wiki um, and the purpose statement that's clearly included as a part of the wiki. So that's, that's um, to summarize everything I had on the agenda for today. Thanks everyone. Pippin, back to you. Yeah, I am now back on the uh, internet, so that's good. I keep uh, talking about people's struggles with that, the whole internet thing, ever since this whole uh, pandemic started. Anyway, um, Money will start the presentation and I will take off, uh, take, um, you know, a few minutes to introduce the paper and then uh, we'll go from there. Money, can you share the paper, the yeah, presentation? Hold on. Yeah, hold on one second. Hello, Paolo. Hi, how are you, Vipin? All right. Everything is good? Yeah. Let's push, push, push. <laughs> yeah. We got to keep, uh, keep at it. Okay. Uh, are you able to see the screen? Yeah. Can you put it in presentation mode maybe? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. The... Hold on one second. I did and then it somehow it went back. All right. I'll go here. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So the full, full paper is divided into two main sections. One is an introduction to central bank money and uh, its relation to money supply, the purpose of central banks and so on. Most people on this call, it should be familiar, but if you're not, you can uh, take a look at it. Uh, the other uh, things in that section are the rationale for CBDC. Several people, several publications, several um, organizations have come up with uh, uh, surveys of what, why CBDC is necessary. Uh, the most important of them being, uh, you know, as part of the public um, service, that is, central banks are at the, uh, you know, uh, are a public organization to serve the public, to uh, achieve monetary stability. And one of the most important features of money, which is to make uh, as a medium of exchange, is to make payments. And so that is one of the central themes of why CBDC is necessary because that that brings forward the payment system into the 21st century, meaning the only way that retail can use central bank money today is using cash, but most interactions are happening over the internet with uh, online payments and so on. So payments using central bank money can only happen if public has access, direct access to central bank money. The other, you know, there are several other rationales. The other ones are mainly related to monetary policy because of the lower bound of cash at a zero percent uh, Monetary policy cannot be implemented properly without, um, without uh, you know, bumping up against that lower zero bound. Uh, but we, we do detail some of those uh, and uh, a very good treatment is in the reference that we have in the paper, which is from ECB, which is a table based on uh, why we should have 
CBDC. Then uh, we go into a small discussion on the models. Um, the most important thing that we uh, detail are the fact that open market operations and other schemes that are uh, that are um, run by the central banks uh, do not reach the public directly and there are problems because of that and also those schemes are uh, you know the central banks have very strong trading teams because they need to operate in the open market and they are huge so they can really swing the prices and the open market operations uh, would also benefit by using wholesale CBDC. That's our contention. So we touched on two uh, wholesale and retail and then we also go a little bit into the cross border uh, section. Now our CBDC implementation focuses on standards and the other thing that it does is it brings contracts into the picture and linking the contracts and payments along with the security is the main theme of the paper. Meaning we are not existing in a vacuum. The payment system is not existing in a vacuum and linking both of them along with existing standards in those areas which we do, which we think will keep advancing forward, uh, especially with the lots of different agencies that are involved in this uh, matter. But we start with what we have today, just to demonstrate how we can use the standards that are today available today to implement this, and we do distinguish the contract standard from CDM from a messaging standard like ISO 2022 and others. And then we go into sketching and implementation based on this very basic uh, building block that is the dual network, we call it the contract and payments. And then we argue for a convergence. That means we do not believe that WCBDC infrastructure the retail CBDC infrastructure and the cross-border CBDC infrastructure should be um, implemented uh, on totally different platforms. We believe it should be integrated at least in this pattern. Uh, and then we go into the next steps for deployment, which is quite uh, extensive. Anyway, I think I've taken up more than enough time and money uh, should uh, continue of the presentation. Um, before we before we jump in, we just want to get any any inputs or opinions from anyone. So far, any questions? Well, from my side, I totally agree with Vipin. Uh, interoperability is key, and standards are the basis for that. And that's why we should focus on that. Will there be a sort of an integrated model with existing financial sort of currencies towards the CDBC or it be like a, a coexisting platform? No, uh, no, uh, uh, none of the uh, proposals ever envisage CBDC as the only one. It is meant to be coexisting with other platforms in the beginning and let the market decide, that is one thing. The second thing is uh, if it exists along with others, other platforms, there have to be interoperability. Anyone else? John, uh, you are the most knowledgeable on this call. Yeah, I think you summarized the summarize you know the issuance rationale and so on so far and we, you know we're also very keen on the uh, idea of uh, of uh, building interoperability but this 
the challenge in achieving that interoperability we found as we discussed with other central banks is that uh, um, first we have to first of all start with defining you know what level of the infrastructure the standardization is to take place and that's kind of a work in progress right now but but we we say in our work that uh, um, it's important for I mean the central banks are starting their efforts right now they're some of them are even piloting and on the verge of of actually activating their their CBDC so um, you know we often say the horse is kind of bolted out of the barn already but uh, um, you know we have to sort of scramble to catch up and and look for some some level at which interoperability can take place uh, so we start off with uh, this uh, very basic diagram um, which was uh, first sort of promulgated by the um, BIS guys as a flower, you know, there were multiple uh, sets beautifully laid out. Now we, we have just these three uh, and we are focusing on WCBDC and RCBDC here, which are uh, issued by the central bank. We're not interested in, uh, in the other picture, but they will exist, coexist with everything that we have. Uh, Mani, you want to go forward? Yeah. Uh, do you want to outline this thing or? Yeah, I mean, we uh, we uh, sort of hinted at this, the open market uh, operations and other functions, uh, repo operations, swap lines, which with other cross currency, uh, with other uh, central banks then um, you know all the other services um, they all seem to all i mean all other operation they seem to br bring the central bank more in line with uh, with the operations of commercial banks as they have huge bigger and bigger trading desks uh, bigger and bigger uh, you know lots of firepower um, they are in the market, um, you know, maybe for a different reason than than uh, regular commercial banks, but their operations seem to resemble more and more the commercial bank operation. So um, we just wanted to, you know, we, the, the journey we took and we ended up in CBDC is interesting in the sense that uh, uh, from a commercial point of view, we are, uh, you know, from um, swaps up or, or, or right now being uh, labeled as OTC uh, digital, we look at uh, all the new emerging digital uh, assets in the marketplace and we wanted to bring in a sort of a capital market infrastructure. And, and that's where we started out uh, connecting to these, some of these assets as they start, you know, uh, being, uh, as these regulated assets uh, and some unregulated uh, but mostly we're focused on regulated assets as these come out of the marketplace. Uh, and also we're seeing the second tier structure being, you can see the exchanges are now developing uh, a, a digital based in, uh, infrastructure for uh, trading uh, where we felt the value add is you know, um, the buy side needs access to this in, uh, market infrastructure and, and we can work with the sell side uh, to uh, provide infrastructure completely based upon digital infrastructure, and that's what we, uh, we are focused on. While we're implementing these uh, solutions, we found that there's always a need for a, a common media or a, a medium of exchange. Uh, while to some extent, uh, stable coins and uh, our commercial bank coins could supplement, we overwhelmingly felt that there was a need for CBDC. And when we started taking a look at CBDC, the implementation, the issuance process of the life cycle very much resembles to what a commercial bank does. Probably. Dan, uh, can you go on mute, please? Dan Schwartz. A conviction. Well, it's, it's, it's conviction and also, oh, I don't want to get this bottom. I want to get the next bottom. That's, that's not conviction. Uh, uh, money, could you? Uh, yeah, 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 I just, I yeah. just muted, put him on mute. Okay. Um, okay, yeah. so as this infrastructure is developed, so we, we felt that there is a commonality between what the commercial banks are trying to achieve and using data and standards and what the central banks are, going to, are trying to achieve with respect to CBDC. And hence we felt that a, uh, our, our participation in capital markets 
uh, and wow. in building standards and more of uh, specific to the digital standards would help a lot on CBDC. And that's why, you know, we took a uh, very serious interest in CBDC. Uh, that's, that's the, you know, the reason why, uh, you know, we initiated an early uh, project within Hyperledger Capital Markets, uh, uh, which is the Ethaler project, uh, essentially the first step to a CBDC, uh, or looking at the life cycle of a simple uh, wholesale CBDC uh, using token taxonomy framework, which is a, another data st a token standard. Uh, and then we started applying, uh, how do we bring in uh, uh, capital market standard, which is the common domain model uh, onto applying CBDC. So I'm going to jump into saying, uh, you know, uh, we, are, uh, we have been associated with the um, ISDA or the uh, uh, Swap Dealers Association, uh, swap, Swaps and Derivatives Association work on CDM for the past three years. Uh, the, the reason why a, a, a separate digital standard is warranted as opposed to what we use today, and we have been using in, um, in the derivatives market and another standard called FTML uh, for almost like 15 years. The main reason is that is uh, the standards like FTML, FixML, and ISO 5020 you know, or 2022 is all designed in an era where there is a, always a centralized player and these act as a messaging uh, structure framework uh, or standards or however you want to call it as more of more of a, a placeholder and then the the implementers being the centralized service providers whether it is a central bank or a ccp or a csd or even um, uh, market middleware providers would make that uh, uh, specific uh, specifications into an actual implementation standard and these standards can vary from uh, uh, one play, one implementation or another, and we have seen this proliferation. Uh, you know, you can talk about the fixed protocol or FTML, uh, or the same thing. We can talk about ISO uh, uh, 20 or 22 standards as well. Then the, the the derivatives association recognized that this will not work on in a peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure where we are trying to deploy uh, DLTs or blockchains where you really want any party to communicate with any other party using a single data standard. And that's where we started off with common domain model. Uh, and earlier on, the focus was on derivatives. Now, in the past six months, we have added all sorts of um, assets from equities to bonds, to digital assets, to the uh, life cycle of uh, common domain models. And uh, now this, uh, the other associations uh, covering uh, repos and security finance have also joined forces with uh, ISDA uh, to comprehensively address the entire, pretty much the product life cycle of every capital market product you can think of, from commodities to a uh, foreign exchange to uh, security finance, you know, derivatives and cash. So that's why we felt that uh, applying the standard uh, uniformly on every uh, DLT or blockchain implementation would that much more help interoperability uh, between uh, capital market service providers. And we felt that it's, it's very much helpful to bring the same idea to CBDC. Uh, this is simply- Also, I, yeah, go ahead. Uh, CDM being a life cycle type uh, standard also can be standalone in the sense that if you serialize the CDM, uh, all the provenance, everything is embedded in it. So it's almost like a mini blockchain in, inside itself. So you can take that CDM, serialized CDM, and move it to another, any other platform. And so it becomes uh, upgradable immediately because you are now not dependent uh, purely on the platform on which it is implemented. Today, most of the standards, uh, most of the POCs of CBDC are on specific uh, blockchain platforms. So this is another reason why CDM would uh, help us move across platforms if need arises. That means if the platform is hacked, there's some problems that come to light, whatever, whatever the reason may be. Anyway, go ahead. Martin. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, to carry on. So the, the, the main problems we, the uh, standard addresses is uh, is portability, as just been uh, talked about, and also interoperability. 
uh, in capital markets, we expect to see dozens of these DLT networks to come addressing various uh, products, and they all have to interact because ultimately uh, they all dependent upon each other. And also, at the end of the day, it, it boils down to how this is, these contracts are uh, linked to payments. And that's where CDM uh, already addresses what, what, is a pay, what would be a payment. Um, I wouldn't want to say a message infrastructure is more of a primitive from a digital standards perspective. Uh, and it is very much, very much uh, very precise in the sense that the payment itself defines the parties and the current, you know, the, whatever the uh, uh, underlying asset uh, to be exchanged. But it, as we've been pointed, uh, it refers to the original contract where this payment uh, started from. And that's where the, uh, the lineage comes in and it's very critical in, in a digital standard, in, in a digital environment, as we may be interoperating between multiple networks, it's important to know where it came from and how we uh, 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 make sure that as an audit trail, not only within the network, uh, uh, it, it's not only uh, internet, but it's all the inter inter-network of networks, uh, how these whole um, chain of information can be carried forward and then be you know, validated. And that's why it, it, the, the standard becomes much, much more uh, uh, critical. Uh, we're going to briefly touch on MPC, which is simply that uh, there are many standards for custody uh, and there are many, many implementations. This is another area where I wouldn't want to call a standard, but a, a, a practice or, or, or different types of technical implementations are emerging. Um, one of the uh, newer ones and most software-based is an, um, a multi-party computation. Uh, we took that approach because that gives the most, uh, as of today, the, the, the best breed of safety and uh, a real time in nature of moving payments between parties. Uh, we, you know, uh, there, as, as we said in the paper, there's a lot to cover on uh, uh, security and, and custody. We just touched upon what we felt the most uh, predominance, uh, again, more, more closer to a standards based. And this is also again taken up by uh, 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 standards organization to bring this in, in more in line uh, as a, at another digital standard. So that's why, you know, we felt that it's important to highlight this. Two, two groups are working on it. One is the NIST for the threshold cryptography standard and also the MPC Alliance for the MPC standard. So they are already working on it, but uh, it's not, it's not uh, cast in stone. The standards are not yet uh, you know, released. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, um, for the purpose of this thing, what we have uh, what we, uh, developed in the white paper and said is this, there are two main principles that a CBDC are, are, are for that matter, any digital asset needs. One is to maintain privacy. The other one is also because it involves digital assets, you really want to have a trust that we call as a current world state. Uh, any given moment, anyone should be able to have a trust in that uh, underlying asset. So we the uh, a DLT provides a, a, a more or less we call it a point-to-point -point network uh, provides a very robust privacy, uh, whereas a blockchain gives you as kind of like a broadcast network, uh, which gives you the current world state. So we felt that combining these two can give us the properties of what we really want to achieve in, in any digital asset and CBDC in particular. Uh, that's why uh, when we look at the life cycle of any, uh, any contract or any business activity, there is always a peer-to-peer -peer contract that must remain pri uh, private but any payments that need to be settled must be visible to the parties such that they trust the digital asset system itself. That's why we, we defined as two different network. We are not suggesting these are, had to be physically two different networks. Uh, if there is a certain uh, blockchain or DLT that can meet these two properties, they can be in the same uh, physical infrastructure. Uh, we just kept it for, from a logical perspective. We're showing that by keeping these networks, we can now create patterns and be able to build on top of the patterns to create the various types of CBDC. And we'll go through this very quickly. Uh, in, in terms of simple issuance, uh, an FSP meaning a bank or a payment service provider uh, can make a request to an issuance, which is a simply a peer-to-peer -peer call to a central bank. Central bank will then verify against the reserve accounts 
uh, and then once it is satisfied the needs, it can then go ahead and issue uh, uh, the request for the appropriate number of CBDC tokens uh, or digital dollars, or whatever you want to call it as, uh, in the asset network, confirms that message back to the FSP, and the FSP can in turn independently verify that this transaction is, com uh, 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 is complete on the asset network, and then hence complete the entire contract. So by this, we are essentially created one pattern whereby an issuance uh, can be made it uniform, and this could be applied to either wholesale or retail. The concept is the same. And thereafter, uh, the FSPs can then directly transfer payments amongst themselves on the asset network based upon either a CDM contract on the CBDC, we call them the CBDC contract network, or it could be uh, another third party network where they have the original contact. It, it's not important. What it matters is that is when there is a payment, we always link that payment to the contract where it uh, started from. That, that's the whole purpose of the, uh, the separation and the defining, the, uh, the defining the roles of the players. Now, on our, uh, we take the same idea and applying it to a retail CBDC, which is the same CDM contract and the same kind of the same uh, you know, asset network, and we now group them together and say, hey, this same pattern can be applied for retail in the sense that the entire operations of issuance and transfers between central banks and FSPs would work exactly the same. Now we are bringing in uh, you know, the retail participants. And how do, how do we bring in a direct claim into this network is by saying a retail user could ask for a registration of a wallet. Here we've given an example on FSP. It need not be an FSP. It could be any, go any government authorized institution. All that we want is that is that particular uh, retail user is somehow uh, identified, gone through some sort of a KYC, and that particular wallet is registered in the, in the uh, uh, RCBDC network. Once the wallet is registered, then the money transfer can happen between the retail users uh, in any form they choose. They do not need the dependence, uh, they do not need an FSP uh, to uh, coordinate any, any sort of uh, interpersonal uh, money transfers. Any questions so far? Uh, yeah, from my side, um, I'm honestly, uh, I'm starting to grasp the value of the CDM contract mm -hmm. in regards to the asset network. And I get that you separate uh, the different aspects of it. So on the asset network, you create the space for different asset networks to coexist. You already mentioned a few of them in the previous slide. And honestly, I'm still struggling a little bit about the core value that you bring with the CDM. If you could just briefly go over it again, I would really appreciate it. Yeah. Just to make, make yeah. the sense. So, so the CDM is essentially a contract network that enables a life cycle of a CBDC. So the life cycle of a CBDC it starts with even on day one, there is a minting process by CBDC. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, we, with the minting process, then there's an issuance process. The issuance process is between an FSP and a central bank. Then we have a transfer between FSP to FSP transfer. And you know, then eventually there could also, there are other functions which will soon be introducing when it comes to cross-border network. Uh, the next step, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss about that. Um, so in reality, uh, what we're trying to say is that is, it is not only about simple uh, payments, if there is a particular central bank and the regulators want uh, to know what is the contract that, for which the payments are happening and they want a record of that, that could also be recorded on the CDM. We are not saying it isn't necessary, but it could be an additional, uh, 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 apart from the so life cycle of CBDC, we are also bringing digital assets into uh, any, any type of digital asset and the life cycle could be recorded in CDM. So you essentially have a placeholder or a central place to record all of your uh, uh, contracts. It is an option. So there's a two-way bridge. Basically, there is a two-way bridge. There is a possibility of a two-way bridge between the CDM contract and the, uh, the, the uh, CBDC uh, network. 
So yeah, it, it will become much more interesting when we start getting into the cross border and, and, and you see the, you know, the, the pattern becomes much more clearer. Uh, just probably it becomes, it becomes easier for this, the current CSD model, right? When you want to interoperate between different currencies mm -hmm. and the CDM would help the current CSD yeah. role to right. interoperate between exactly. different digital. Yeah. Yeah. But I understand. That's, yeah. What you're to, that's what you're going to go to the, in the next one. Which, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. So uh, I'll go move on to the next one. This is, so now we are saying we, we looked at how wholesale works and how retail works. Here is the pattern where which, how it becomes integrated. So if a central bank is looking at saying, how do I ensure that we have a standard way of implementing both wholesale and, secure and retail, this is how it, it would operate. Now, uh, one of the interesting uh, properties of such uh, interoperable networks is that is the FSPs are constantly going to move money between a wholesale and a retail because sometimes they may need it, the transfer. And that's again, facilitated by the central bank because if an FSP felt that they need a lot more tokens on the retail side, then, or then they are using on the wholesale, they could simply make another contract request to the central bank saying, please move X amount from my wholesale to my retail or vice versa. And the, con the CDM contact will help through. It's actually almost acting like a mini uh, exchange between two networks. So that's why, again, the interoperability adds value. Um, and again, it's a pattern, but it, it, the implementation because of it is CDM and, and the digital asset could be of any network. It, this can be implemented by, by any number of parties. Uh, all that we are saying is these are standards. Uh, once you apply to the standard, uh, the banks are free to choose any technology, any technology providers to build these networks because interoperability is at the data standard level, not at the physical uh, uh, physical uh, network level, which is the blockchain or DLT uh, physical platform. Mm -hmm. So, so you're saying at, at, at the end of the day, you're saying that even the central bank can use the CDM contract to update its own balance sheet, right? That's up to them. I mean, you know, if it is, if it's, if within, for example, uh, if Fed is an example where it is spread between multiple uh, regions, uh, uh, and there they could share a common infrastructure like a CDM to share the balance sheet and and, and the and the operations between the various um, yeah, uh, various Feds within 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 the US. The, the, the ECB could be using. Yeah. So, but that's that's not our focus here. Yeah. But your point is right, uh, Paul. That, that any uh, financial contract, any fine operations could be standardized on CDM. Now, taking to the next level is that is we do see this cross currency infrastructure where uh, two central banks occasionally need to exchange their uh, currencies uh, for whatever reason, and, and it's been happening off late because of COVID nineteen. And, and at the end, of course, in 2008, that this kind of operations come in periodically. Uh, and again, by applying standard cross-currency swaps, which is already covered by CDM, this is commercial banks do it all the time. We follow the same pattern whereby the, uh, one central bank makes the request for a cross-currency swap, the other bank verifies, uh, and it is possible to do this, whatever the internal verification is. And then they will confirm that they would then go ahead with the actual transfer of uh, the uh, uh, cross, -currencies, uh, cross currencies. Step A is involved, each party then sending their transaction to the other party. And the, the, the party is then verifying it. This is just one leg. That is what you call it, the, the, the initial or the spot leg. And then you could take the same idea and then apply it to the forward leg, which is three months forward, the currencies are, 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 are the payments are reversed. But we are applying the same commercial bank uh, CDM contract to a cross-border infrastructure. So which means now already there's a standard there, you know, we can be applied to bring in a cross-border transaction between two central banks. Manny, th this is Dan. I'm going to, I'm still struggling to be honest with uh, the focus on CDM as the solution. And, you know, my own experience on is, is on the, traditional asset side. So apologies, not so familiar with the digital asset side. CDM really arose because there's, there were long lived transactions which evolved over time. 
and it was a way to embed the evolution of the transaction directly in the transaction itself. Meaning if there's a rate reset, the contract itself knew how to deal with the rate reset and calculate what would be the next payment. Simple example. I can see the value of adding uh, uh, central bank digital currencies to um, to avail to be uh, to take advantage of the the templates or structures that are that will be established in CDM. And CDM, by the way, for all, um, not entirely well adopted yet. I mean, is it set to the emerging digital standard? Yes, yeah. right. Uh, biggest adoption is probably in equity derivatives. Um, but okay, the problem that it seems that you're talking about is, is more or less than, to me, it seems twofold. The first is enabling CB, um, central bank digital currency CBDCs as a new cur quote unquote currency type within, um, this, the ISDA realm. And the second is, uh, interoperability between wallets or settlement process. And the latter, I don't think CDM really is great at accomplishing. Am I missing? I guess the, the fundamental point is, what am I missing? Because those seem to me the problems you're stating and they, they yeah, yeah. seem to have different Yeah, so, so when you take the, take the second part of the actual settlement, right? Uh, when in, in this example, there is a settlement that needs to be verified between these two central banks. Central Bank A said, say, delivered dollar, and Central Bank B delivered, or Central Bank one delivered dollar, and Central Bank two delivered euro. Uh, now, those two messages, somehow they had to communicate saying that each one has to indicate what wallet they want the money to be transferred, and then the other party actually initiates the transfer, and then the, the requesting party now has to verify that the money got transferred. That's right, but, another that's area where CDM like comes into the picture because it's acting more or less like a contract mechanism and looking at the simple life cycle of how do you, you know, exchange payments. Uh, you know, but CDM really doesn't, isn't focused on the hard mechanics of settlement. CDM is focused it, on the life cycle right, evolution right. of... Um, life cycle, you're, you're, you're right. But any life cycle needs a workflow, right? Even if you take the very basic life cycle, it needs, it needs two, work, two parties to initiate a workflow. What CDM... Uh, defines is the data standard on that particular li life cycle endpoints. And in this scenario, the workflow mechanism itself refers to the actual settlement. And as each part of the settlement by each central bank, it gets recorded on the ledger. And that's what, you know, you're simply repeating that CDM construct again and again to inform that you have done your part and you're waiting for the counterparty to do their part. And thereby, when those two parts completed, the contract itself gets uh, complete. So, yeah. And so, look, uh, my last point is um, I agree with you. Well, I agree with you that abstractly um, there's a workflow. I don't think CDM actually has huge, it has life cycle events. I'm not certain about settlement workflow events. And I'll just there are no, let me clarify that these are data standards. There are CDM does not rep, uh, uh, represent workflow events. They left it out as implementation because this right. implementation can be very different from different networks. If you're doing, you know, in a traditional network is one way, and if you're implementing on a digital network is another way, uh, it, it is designed to say the various states of a life cycle of, of, of any contract. And we are not even talking about, you know, if you go further into DVP. Uh, uh, you know, delivery versus payment, PVP, which we discussed now, uh, or even simple, sometimes single payment. All of these things are covered under uh, uh, under a, a under a contract uh, which comes from a original source of a contract. Yeah, that's where the, the real value that keeps coming. Yeah, I agree with you on the simple fact. If I have a simple messaging to send a payment across, why not ISO? You know, standard or even a fixed messaging protocol will not will work. And again, this is where I, we, we originally discussed. These were standards proposed in a centralized environment where there is a central party would step in and define these standards. We are now moving completely or moving towards an enabling a peer-to-peer -peer economy uh, where there are no centralized player who could step in and define the standard and hence the standard itself could, could be precise. Yeah, standard right uh, can we, can we proceed with the, with the talk? And we can answer some of these uh, questions 
uh, later on. And your uh, question has been noted, uh, Dan, and your skepticism about the use of CDM in this context is noted. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, and apologies for derailing. No, no problems. No problems. Okay. Uh, we're just going to go into quickly in the very last step. And here is this other cross border network where two banks who are involved in cross border transactions, we again simplified it. If you look at this as a CBDC network, where we talk about central bank exchanging currencies, we take the same idea and applying it between two FSPs exchanging currencies, the same concept. Uh, and we talk about a cross border CDM contract. Again, this is a you know, long lived contract, it should be anywhere from a, you know, a couple of months to a year or year, you know, 18 months, depending upon what the contract is. Uh, so we are uniformly applying the same concept for all functions of CBDC. That's what we are, you know, we are, we are, we are proposing to write here. I think we would stop at this point. I, we would, I wouldn't want to go too far into CDMs and events. This is for maybe another day's discussion. Uh, let's focus on the white paper and then, you know, definitely points like Dan, you know, it's, it's worth exploring. Vipin, you have anything to comment? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, we, we presented what a wide scope in a very short period of time. Uh, there are still unanswered questions. Many of them are, uh, are also in the paper at the end because in order to go to a deployment for a CBDC, which is a very sensitive uh, topic, for central banks, we have to go through a lot of different, um, you know, different steps. There have to be processes in place um, to secure the network, to do all kinds of other stuff, which are very, very important. Uh, and as far as the CDM, the use of CDM for this particular um, contract infrastructure, uh, we acknowledge the fact that CDM is not getting a lot of take up, but there is no comparable standard. Uh, the ones that are proposed by most central banks like ISO 2022 is, uh, are monsters. They are um, basically uh, meta standards and um, uh, they are uh, episodic. They are not uh, they're not uh, doing any kind of uh, life cycle tracing, any kind of uh, linkages, uh, you know, the hashing functions are problematic. They have introduced a header recently, which uh, seems to be a last minute attempt to get some kind of a cryptographic verifiability into the process. But even that is sl slipping out of, you know, they, they have, uh, there are multiple ways in which you can implement that. Uh, anyway, the point here, which is made in the paper, is also that CDM uh, is the one that we have today, and something like it will will be the solution in the future. Uh, standards are still evolving, but we are just looking at you know like. John said, the horse is already out of the stable in some places. So uh, will they come back to uh, a standard-based implementation? Who knows? The Chinese already almost ready to deploy DCEP, which is the most uh, large-scale uh, deployment that is possible. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, the you know, the next steps are to engage uh, and also to give us give us feedback about this paper so that we can improve it. By any means, we don't consider it, uh, you know, complete, um, but it's, it's just an opening salvo, not just in writing a paper, but in actually putting it into practice. Several of these things are already built. Anyway, Satish, can you, um, um, you know, you can go ahead and uh, announce your um, your meeting, yeah. and um, Thank you. Thank we you will engage me? later. Uh, can you hear me? Is I'm audible? Yes. 
Yeah. 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 Uh, Money, if you don't mind, can you just quickly uh, bring up the Gits 2020 or can I quickly do a screen share? Um, how do I do that? Because I'm... Just, well, um, uh, I mean, uh, Satish, I think you can just do a small. Yeah, I'll circulate the material quickly, guys. Um, we are doing a global information technology summit this Friday 11th. So it's a complete virtual one. Usually we do it like a proper one. Last year it was in London School of Economics. We did a full one. This year we are going a virtual. It's a global one and we have brilliant presenters. I won't take much time over there. I will send the details out through Wipin. And uh, do do please um, register and uh, attend the meeting. We do, and we are planning to open the event with um, blockchain in fintech, our favorite subject. Any queries, you can just um, you know ping me. Uh, my email is on the on the on the network, so you can just uh, send it across to me if you have any queries. I'm registering. So thank um, you. Money, any last thoughts before we close? No, no, we, you know, we, we wait for anyone else to give their comments. Uh, you know, uh, obviously, we, 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 can, you, can you indicate how they can provide us the comments back to us? Um, so either by email or uh, by referring to the paper itself. Uh, we don't have the paper open for public comments, uh, Money. Or should we throw it open to public comments? Yeah, at this point, we, you know, we opened up select few, particularly, you know, obviously the capital markets being one of them. Uh, we want to see if there any, any any challenges and there are obvious you know, issues. Maybe we, we, we could take a, uh, some time with Dan and see his concerns and really understand. And that would be worthwhile. Uh, otherwise, the Hyperledger itself, they can put their comments, right? I mean, they can log into Hyperledger and, and and re register the comments, correct? So it's for everyone. Yes, we can, uh, we can actually uh, have a page specifically devoted to that. And uh, so everyone can see the comments. That. Yeah, that'll be easier for everyone to see their, their comments. All right. Thank you. Any Thank other you comments at last minute or? or Yeah, well, from my side, I, I think it's really important to have a specific page to share with the, with the Hyperledger community because I see, uh, at least I have the perception that the CBDC discussion is, is picking up within the Hyperledger community. And it's going to be a topic in, in, in this week's summit. So if we could at least mention the work that is being done here, I think it would be valuable for the whole community. Does yeah, that make sense? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, we we are not uh, participating in the in the in the summit because we are not members, I guess. <laughs> but oh, uh, no, it's open, guys. Well, it's free. It's open. If you want to throw something in, let me know. Um, I'm no, no, I'm not talking about the G GITS, but uh, uh, about the Hyperledger member summit. Oh, but that doesn't mean that I cannot briefly mention the work that's being done. Oh yeah, yeah, right. sure. You should you should mention it if it uh, if it intrigues you and if it is if you think it is important. Yeah, I think it, I think it's important, and I think it the value should be given to the people that are driving this discussion here. So, so regardless of the membership approach, I think it it, it makes sense to at least mention the work that you're doing on the standard side because it will benefit a lot of players. Thank you. So that's it. Um, we will um, convene the next meeting. It's going to be an interesting one with uh, Tanjam talking about their disconnected uh, CBDC approach, which is uh, smart card based. We didn't even uh, go there on in this paper yet, but in the paper there are uh, indications that we can have an anonymous uh, CBDC and similar to what the Chinese are doing with the different levels. Uh, that means if you have a, a level two or level three um, wallet, 
then you can only hold so much and you can only transact so much without KYC. Anyway. Interesting. All right. Okay. Thank you, Vipin. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. For time, you know, more than happy to give your comments, please. We'll take a look and follow through. Thank you.